Hello and welcome to Mostly Weather. We are back today nominating a notable scientist into our Mostly Weather Hall of Fame, who's going to be joining the ranks of Ekman, Ella Richardson and also James Lovelock. Today on the panel, I'm joined by Catherine Ross. Hello. And our special guest, Dan Harris. Hi, I'm Dan Harris, Deputy Chief Meteorologist at the Met Office. And I'm here to induct Jewel Charney into the Mostly Weather Hall of Fame. Jewel Charney was an American meteorologist. He was active from the 1940s right through until his death in the early 1980s. And he is an absolute giant in uh, meteorology. Amongst his most notable achievements, I mean, this podcast is not long enough to contain his uh, many achievements, but he was involved in the very first numerical weather prediction forecast, NWP forecast, on the ENIAC computer in 1950. Can I just stop you there, Dan? What's ENIAC? ENIAC is one of the first supercomputers, I suppose. ENIAC stands for Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator or something like that. He sounds like an amazing man. I mean, he sounds like he was the you know top of his tree. He had a Russian Jewish background, moved to America in the uh, the early 1900s, was born in San Francisco, I believe, uh, 1st of January 1917. In his formative teenage years, he discovered a real love for mathematics and uh, ended up studying uh, mathematics and physics at the UCLA. At around the time of the Second World War, when it became evident that America was going to uh, be drawn into World War II, uh, he had a bit of a choice to make. Would he go into aeronautical engineering or would you go into meteorology and obviously there was a huge demand for newly trained meteorologists at that time in order to help with things like aviation forecasting and uh, he had a a very chance meeting with um, another very well respected figure in meteorology uh, Theodore von Kármán you may have heard of von Kármán vortices. Uh, Can can you explain (laughs) them for the lay man and woman? (laughs) Sure Von Kármán vortices, um, they're a form of, I guess, atmospheric turbulence. You see really nice examples of these uh, downstream of uh, small islands such as the Canary Islands. And you see these kind of alternating clockwise and counterclockwise circulations in the cloud sheet. Um, And yeah, and those are kind of turbulence. The way a flag waves and flaps in the wind, that's a form of von Kármán vortex turbulence. Ah. And uh, so, yeah, these von Kármán vortices are named after Theodore von Kármán. Um, who is a very well-respected meteorologist. And uh, it was under his advice that uh, Joel Charney decided to go into meteorology. Before that, he was a very gifted mathematician looking for some problems to attack. And uh, von Kármán suggested meteorology as the kind of new up-and-coming field where things could be discovered. Charney did indeed begin to devote himself to meteorology. And uh, after a few years undertaking various positions, such as lecturer, teaching assistant, He formulated his seminal work on uh, something called baroclinic instability, which formed the basis of his PhD thesis. It's the process that develops the weather systems that we in the UK here are intimately familiar with. It's the wind, it's the rain, it's the showers following. All of those weather systems, those weather regimes come about by this phenomenon called baroclinic instability, which until the time of George Harney, didn't really have a rigorous theoretical explanation. And he was the first person to bring about that theoretical explanation. And it's interesting what you say about his um, PhD, Dan, because I, I was reading that his PhD dissertation was titled The Dynamics of Long Waves in a Baroclinic Westerly Current. That's right. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> and it was such an important dissertation that it took up the entire October 1947 issue of the Journal of Meteorology. So in sort of layman's terms, what does that title actually mean, the dynamics of long waves in a baroclinic westerly current? Gosh, OK, um, <laughs> let's, let's try and break that down then. So dynamics, we're talking about fluid dynamics, really, fluid flow and processes that happen within fluid flow. So the westerly current, I mean, that really refers to, I guess in layman's terms, the jet stream. Baroclinic refers to temperature gradients. So in our mid-latitude atmosphere, because of the dynamics and uh, the rotation of the Earth, the temperature gradient where you have sort of intense heating near the equator and not very much heating near the pole. So that sets up a, an equator to pole temperature gradient. 
due to the Earth's rotation and other factors, that gets concentrated into very narrow bands, which when weather systems develop, we would recognise those as warm fronts and cold fronts. But that baroclinicity, that temperature gradient is always there. And it's that temperature gradient which gives rise to this particular hydrodynamic instability called baroclinic instability, which results in, in the weather systems that we see. And the long waves, the final thing, I guess the atmosphere can support waves on a huge range of scales, right from planetary scale waves, which we would call the long waves, right to the scale of tiny little sound waves, which you know propagate at hundreds of metres per second. The motions in the atmosphere can support waves of those wavelengths and all the wavelengths in between. So dynamics of long waves in a baroclinic westerly current. It's not surprising, really, that this dissertation was so influential in the world of meteorology back in the mid-1940s. And I suppose it's not really a surprise that he went on to become a research associate at the University of Chicago, working with Carl Gustav Rossby. And of course, he was famous for large-scale air movements. Rossby is another intellectual giant in the uh, arena of meteorology. The first meteorologist to appear on the cover of Time magazine, I believe. From what I've read, I believe they had a, a very strong personal and working relationship. Charney describes them as kindred spirits. And he said that he discovered what it's like to have a real intellectual rapport with someone when he met and, and got to know Rosby. So they were they were firm friends, good colleagues, and um, they really kind of drove each other and um, they had traits which enabled them to get the best out of each other. So they did great work together then, Dan, but uh, I understand for a year between 1947 and 1948, Charney then held a National Research Council postgraduate fellowship at the University of Oslo. And during this year, he developed a technique known as the quasi-geostrophic approximation for <laughs> calculating fantastic. the large-scale motions of planetary scale waves. I mean, this just sounds... Wow, it just sounds amazing, the work that he was doing at this time. It was absolutely groundbreaking. And it's worth noting, actually, that Charney did a lot of this work independently. And he says that these problems, it was the first time that he felt like he was really doing groundbreaking, challenging research. And, and it's absolutely true. It was, it was fundamental, groundbreaking stuff. But it was in the context of you know the 1940s, the 1950s, and particularly the 1940s, where a lot of people were working on these kind of meteorological problems, inspired by the work of people uh, like Rosby and, and Sutcliffe and numerous others, the Norwegian school, the work of Björkness. So they were a short way along the what is a very now long line of meteorological greats. And Charney's work on baroclinic instability was also independently being done in a slightly different way by an English meteorologist called Eric Eady. The way that Charney approached the problem of baroclinic instability was to take the full set of primitive equations, filter out all of the, the meteorologically unimportant noise. So those sound waves that we talked about, the, the gravity waves, all of those that are unimportant for the scale of motion that he was interested in. And he was able to develop this simplified equation set called the quasi-geostrophic equations. That then enabled him and, and many other theorists following him to more rigorously analyse various aspects of weather systems that we all know and love today. Talking about simplifying equations, um, for me, the father of that kind of concept is Lewis Fry Richardson, who was sort of working in the, the World War I period. He was the first person, to my knowledge, to kind of start coming up with a theoretical concept of, of numerical weather prediction and using the equations of physics in some way, um, although he didn't have a computer to put it on, so he couldn't do anything with it. Did Charney take inspiration from uh, Richardson at all, or are they sort of independent pieces of work? Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. You know, it must have been an absolutely amazing time to be alive and be involved in the world of meteorology. You know, and all, the, all these characters were, you know, working together. All the work was very recent. The actual fundamentals of numerical weather prediction originally go back to Willem Bjerknes, who was the first to really suggest that primitive equations could be used in a system to systematically forecast the weather. And it was Lewis Fry Richardson that really first brought to bear the mathematical skills 
in order to do that. So what Richardson did is he took the primitive equations and he basically numerically integrated them to come up with the forecast. And as I'm sure many of the listeners will know, the forecast was in one way a spectacular failure because oh, yeah. the, <laughs> the, the forecast that was created obviously took a lot longer than the actual time it took for the weather to happen. Um, and the forecast was wrong by orders of magnitude. Part of the reason for that is not because Richardson's technique or, or which his, he got his sums wrong, but there were things about atmospheric motion that, that weren't really that well understood. There were things about having to balance the fields of mass and motion that, that weren't really understood. I believe that Charney sent the results of the first computerised forecast to Richardson. And um, so it's really nice that Richardson was kind of able to see the, the fruits of his labour you know, back in the, the 30s or whenever it was, it must have been earlier than that. 1921, um, he published his book. In the 20s, yeah. that's right. Of course, because he, he, um, he was a paramedic in the First World War, wasn't he, Richardson? Yeah, he was um, a, an ambulance driver, yeah. That's, that's right. Yeah, so the work he did in the early 1900s, and his, his very poetic imagining of, of 64,000 human computers <laughs> yes. in, a, in a giant concert hall was kind of born out in this electronic computer, which took the, you know, took the place of these imagined 64,000 human computers. Charney, obviously, as you say, drew inspiration from Richardson, but he also worked with a noted mathematician of the time in the sort of mid late 40s, uh, John von Neumann. And together, they helped pioneer the use of computers and numerical techniques to improve weather forecasting. So not only involved in numerical weather prediction, but also he then went on to play a leading role in the efforts to integrate sea air exchanges of energy and moisture into the study of climate. That's right. I mean, there's, there's no question about it. He was an amazing meteorologist, you know, as well as being an extremely important meteorologist. The things that you you glean from the, the photographs of him, really great, really affable, charismatic, uh, friendly person. And I don't think anyone would have had a bad word to to say about him. You know, he, he wasn't what they call an ivory tower academic. He was willing to help people with problems. He was willing to discuss ideas about anything with anyone. Well, I understand the centenary celebration that was held in February uh, 2018 in one of the presentations, Joseph Pedlowski, um, a scientist emeritus at the Woods Hole Oceanography Institute and world leader in physical oceanography, said this of his friend and also mentor, uh, Jules Charney. What he said was, it's fair to say that Jules Charney turned the mystery of the erratic behaviour of the atmosphere into a recognisable, although very, very difficult problem in fluid physics. I would like, however, to talk today about Jules' more personal and I think equally vital contribution to our field in terms of the inspiring generosity of spirit he showed that advanced the atmosphere of collaborative congeniality in our field. He set a standard for personal and scientific integrity that I think is often overlooked but of exceptional importance. It's quite moving that, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it is, isn't it? And so he's obviously inspired many of his uh, peers and colleagues, but also the next generation of meteorologists and scientists and mathematicians. Uh, and, and sort of thinking about that as well, as if all that work wasn't enough, he was also involved in an ad hoc study on carbon dioxide and climate, which he did for the National Research Council in the US back in 1979, which, you know, you think about where we are now, was the foresight to do that piece of work. And, you know, the results um, are confirmed by, you know, present day science and research in into this topic. Just, I mean, just going back a bit, I mean, you asked me about the this, the subsequent developments of NWP, um, I think in, in the 50s, you know, when the first numerical integration took place on the ENIAC machine, it was envisaged that this would be the start of a hierarchy of models. And Joel Charney was a real advocate of starting simple and gradually building up and going to more and more complex models, adding increasing complexity to make the model more and more realistic, but at the same time, always being grounded in reality. And, and that's something which I think... <laughs> which I think meteorologists, um, certainly in my experience, and, and I'm guilty of it just as much as any anyone, 
these days where you have you know numerical models on tap very advanced numerical models very high resolution available all the time online you, you can lose sight of the fact that these are trying to represent physical processes and just you know look at the meteorology but dual very much you know set the set the bar for having an eye on are these models producing plausible results and always being grounded uh, in reality? And yeah, did a lot of pioneering work in the 50s in, in building up our capabilities with uh, numerical models. Um, he um, established the um, the NWP department in the US Weather Bureau, I think it was something like 1954. Certainly in the early 1950s, he was instrumental in introducing numerical weather prediction into operational use into the US Weather Service. That was a collaboration, wasn't it, between the US Weather Bureau, the Air Force and also the Navy. So uh, as as his um, colleague said in his centenary celebration, he, he was very collaborative in his way of working as well as being an exceptional scientist. Just looking through a, a small selection of his papers, he made some seminal contributions and established himself as a as one of the leading figures in 20th century meteorology, but he also wrote papers with a lot of different collaborators on on a number of topics, and not just in meteorology as well. Um, he extended his influence towards oceanography using the the techniques and the knowledge he gleaned from meteorology um, to write some important papers in in oceanography. There's one called the Gulf Stream as an inertial boundary layer, which as a meteorologist and not an oceanographer, um, the details are somewhat a little bit hazy to me. But yeah, certainly he was uh, influential in that field as well. Just coming back to the fact that, that he, in 1979, chaired an ad hoc study group on carbon dioxide and climate. What do you think he would make of the present research and science of sort of climate change? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> no, sorry, <laughs> what, what a, big what question. a question. I mean, I, I, I couldn't hope or presume to uh, be able to tell you what he might think of, think of such things. Um, having been born four years after his death, obviously I didn't, didn't know him, um, which um, is, I, I, I think that's a real shame for me. I mean, he's someone I would absolutely love to have met. He's a real hero of mine. Um, but I mean, what what would he have made? I mean, first and foremost, you know, he was a he was a scientist. He's a very good scientist. I think he would have been pleased to see the efforts that he and his group kicked off in '79 have developed, and you know, and, and, and science has advanced, and how much science has advanced in those forty odd years. He'd be vindicated. He and his group would be vindicated. I mean, in the original report, I mean, it was the first rigorous scientific assessment of the the global climate models of the time. You know, the first rigorous report into the effects of carbon dioxide and the increase in carbon dioxide on global temperature. The science was very much in its infancy in those times, but the link between greenhouse gases and warming global temperatures was clear as it is today. And their best estimates of the warming for, I think it was a a doubling of carbon dioxide, equates to something like a three degree Celsius warming as their best estimate. Obviously, they had reasonably large error bars with that because there's a lot of uncertainty involved in climate science. And certainly there was back in those days. So, Dan, I was just thinking, you know, some of the names you've mentioned already, people like Bjorkness, Sutcliffe, these are some of the giants of meteorology, you know, and they were all working around the, around the 40s. And they were all, I would suggest, quite ahead of their time, you know, including uh, obviously Charney. You know, they're really quite the names. They're finding the jet stream. They're finding all these sort of meteorological concepts that are so important now to modelling. And of course, kind of quite recently, two more of Charney's compatriots of their time, um, Munnaby and Hasselman, have, have been awarded the Nobel Prize. Yeah, Charney and his group really kind of set the foundation stones for all of the work that has come after them. The stuff that Charney and, and the group that he led set in motion, how it's still relevant today. And I think if Charney was alive today, you know, he'd still be at the forefront of that. Yeah, just think what he would he could do with the you know, the models and the and the systems we've got now with his brain on top of that. I think he'd be the first to acknowledge that it it wouldn't be a a sole effort. He would be collaborating with the the top minds of today and and you know and fruitfully discussing things and and coming up with work in and results in a in a collaborative fashion. <laughs> 
I wonder, what would you ask him, Dan? You said you wish you'd been able to meet him, but there was unfortunately four years between his demise and your birth. But what would you ask him? I would be far too starstruck <laughs> to uh, to ask him anything. It's interesting came... you say starstruck because his students appar- apparently described it as falling into the orbit of the Charney sun. So I think he'd be doing the same. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we sometimes discuss this amongst colleagues and not necessarily just with Charney, but I would certainly be really interested to hear his take on it. And it, it is what he would make of operational meteorology today. Certainly in the, in the early days of his involvement in meteorology, a slightly um, disproving um, take or disapproving take of the kind of techniques that were used at the time. And, and, and those consisted of drawing lots of maps and analysing the data and, and extrapolating an, an analogue. You know, we, we know today that because the weather is a chaotic system, analog methods for, for forecasting the weather on short and medium term scales anyway doesn't work. Every weather system's different. And we know that extrapolation just doesn't work because weather systems develop. But we we do now appreciate, and I think Charney came to later appreciate the fact that to really get a sense of the weather and be able to kind of forecast what it's going to do next, you really need to get involved with what's happening in, happening now and immerse yourself in the data. And in today's world of operational meteorology, where everything is just very time pressured, everything is, what's this model saying? What's that model saying? Lots of weight is given to numerical models and, and less weight than it used to be on really getting into and analysing the data. And I, I, I'd just be fascinating to hear what he thought of today's world of operational meteorology and how forecasts are made and how much store is set in analysing model output and yeah, just his, his whole take on that world, really. Right from first principles of the founding of the Met Office in 1854, it's always been about you start with the observations of you know of what's going on, and then you can analyse. And it's it's amazing that you know, that first principle is still so much with us. Rightly so, and and fundamentally so, because I mean the the models we have these days, you know, are, are worlds away from the first models that Charney was working on. Let alone um, what Fitzroy had to play with. <laughs> let alone what well, Fitzroy didn't have a model, but uh, no. <laughs> but um, you know what we have today looks so realistic and it's so high resolution and it's available, you know, every, every hour. But at the end of the day, if it doesn't look like what it's supposed to look like now at t at naught, then it might look really realistic at t plus twelve, but but it's rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> because because if you don't ground yourself in what's happening right now and how well the models are performing with the with the analysis stage then then you can't really hope that the model will give you an accurate forecast for a later time step later on in his life he was involved in a number of other topics that that may be more familiar so um he was involved in kind of the first studies in how hurricanes grow um and he also worked on the vertical prop- propagation of waves and why that's important well you may have heard of things like, uh, a thing called sudden stratospheric warming that's quite a, a vogue topic and has been for some years now in the winter when we're looking at the long range forecasts one of the main drivers we look at is the stratospheric polar vortex and that generally blows in a counterclockwise fashion around the North Pole or the South Pole in the Southern Hemisphere winter, but certainly the North Pole in our winter. And uh, occasionally that's subject to waves and occasionally breaks down into into smaller circulations. And that, that's what we call a sudden stratospheric warming. And he did a lot of seminal work in the vertical propagation of waves and vertically propagating waves into the stratosphere is one of the mechanisms, in fact, the mechanism by which the, the stratospheric vortex gets knocked about and displaced and, and eventually breaks down. And finally, um, I did a bit of research, research right at the end of his life in a phenomenon called blocking. Um, again, another wave type phenomena. You know, that's a theme that runs right through his life, um, atmospheric waves simplifying conceptual models, boiling them down to their the parts that are only really important for the scales that they're interested in or that he was interested in. Um, and with a with a scientist or mathematician called DeVore, he worked on a paper about atmospheric blocking. And blocking is a weather forecasting phenomenon 
whereby instead of the nice normal changeable westerly airflow that we get off the Atlantic, which brings us wind and rain, followed by a nice sunny day or showers in the northwest, and then the next system arrives, when you get blocking, the atmosphere gets into a bit of a tiz, I suppose, a bit of a, a slower moving state, and you can get big areas of high pressure, which lead to days and days of settled weather, and in the winter that would be frost and fog. Or, or on the other side of the coin, you can get stuck in days and days of low pressure and and wind and rain and and a, a rather unsettled pattern and yeah he did some of the the seminal work around that i think this year it rained every day for about 3 months or something i can't remember <laughs> now but it was a very long pattern <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for, it's my it's my it's my perception, and, and it, anecdotally, and also other people have, have noticed this too. It, it does seem to be, and, and I say this is completely anecdotally and very unscientific, and and Jill Charney would probably disapprove. Um, but the weather of recent years does seem to be characterized more by these longer lasting regimes so you get you know rather than a a day or two of unsettled weather followed by a day or two of settled weather followed by another system coming in the settled spells the dry spells can last for a week or two weeks and and then you get into a regime of of unsettled weather where it rains for weeks so uh, and those instances yeah to my mind very anecdotally do seem to be getting more common I think we can safely say that we can induct Jules yes. Charney into the Hall of Fame. He sounds like one of the most amazing people in the history of weather. So welcome, Jules Charney. You're in. Yeah, very, very interesting, Dan. And thank you very much indeed for introducing us to life and work of um, Jules Charney. And as Catherine has said, we are very, very honoured to welcome Jules Charney into the Mostly Weather Hall of Fame. Thank you very much indeed for joining Catherine and myself today. Thank you for having me and it's been a yeah, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure. That's it for another episode of Mostly Weather. Thank you very much indeed to Catherine Ross and also to our special guest Dan Harris for introducing us to Jules Charney. Please join us again soon for another episode of Mostly Weather. Mostly Weather is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office Weather app.